Well, welcome to uh, Google Forms. May the forms be with you. This is the fourth iteration of Google Forms. Uh, I'm an OG, original Googler. I've been around for forms since what they first rolled out. And so I've been through all four iterations. And uh, so far, this is my favorite. Um, I hear a lot of people that are talking about it and that are not too terribly happy about it. But um, they, uh, they are, have worked out really well for me, and uh, they're pretty cool. So my name is Will Kimbley. Uh, I'm an instructional technology consultant. Uh, I work in a number of fields, uh, Tulare County Office of Education. Uh, I work uh, teach credential courses at the New Teacher and Leadership Development, and I'm part of TCAL, which is Technology Information Center for Administrative Leadership, as well as a few other things you can see there on the board, Middle Elementary School, wrote lessons plans for in, the movie Interstellar, uh, and uh, apparently I like to do PD way too much because I've got a few badges there. So again, the website for all my resources, uh, all my, all my uh, workshops, including ones that I'm not even doing here at this conference, are at teachinteractive.org. My contact information is there. I'm on Twitter at, at Will Kimbley. So if I say anything worth repeating today, feel free to tweet it out and tag me in it, at Will Kimbley, and follow along. Uh, I do provide free lifetime tech support for all my PD. So uh, if you tweet me, I will usually tweet back pretty quickly and give you an answer. Uh, usually I'll make one up, but sometimes I'll come up with the right answer occasionally. So can you tell I taught middle school? The sarcastic streak is strong in me. A couple of great things uh, that Q is putting on that I happen to be part of, the Q Rockstar Teacher Camps. Uh, one of them that I'm going to be presenting at, uh, we'll be doing this uh, session hands-on, uh, is Q Rockstar Mammoth. So check that out at qrockstar.org. Uh, at 9,000 feet, we have the highest level PD in the world. <laughs> Just saying, okay? So and there ain't no mountain high enough for Q Rockstar Mammoth. And I'll also be at the LEAD 3 Symposium. If you're an administrator, uh, you, are, you believe in technology, check out the LEAD 3 Symposium. Q is part of that. I'm also part of TCAL, and TCAL is one of the other partners that puts that on. So I'll be there if you want to see a little bit more of some of the workshops that I do. So a question I get a lot is, what is a form? Um, I didn't used to include this part in my workshops. I just kind of dived in because I figured people knew what forms were. And then somebody says, stop and says, well, what, what is a form? So essentially what a form is, is it takes something that looks like this, where it asks some questions. And there are nine different question types. Uh, it takes that information. And it can then data analyze that and create things, charts and graphs like this. And this here has actually been around, but they've made it a little more available to you now. Uh, for multiple choice questions, it will automatically create these charts and graphs for you, uh, and they correlate with what the questions you see over here uh, and it creates that. So you, it's easy to gather data, to analyze it, to look at it, and graph it. Uh, it can also take that information and drop it into a spreadsheet. So if you're taking a survey or quizzes or gathering information, there's a lot of ways to use Google Forms. Uh, sometimes you want to drop that into a spreadsheet so you can sort and analyze the data. Uh, also new in spreadsheets, and we're not really going to cover spreadsheets here today, but there is the ability to analyze the data graphically. There's a little button, and I'll show you this a little later on. We'll kind of dive in a little closer that it allows you to uh, look at the data in the spreadsheet with graphs and charts as well. So, and it makes them for you automatically. So it's kind of a cool feature. So that's essentially what a form is. It's a way of creating quizzes, surveys, collecting data, uh, and analyzing that and utilizing that data that's collected in a variety of different ways. All right, so as I mentioned, there, this is the fourth iteration of forms, fourth major iteration of forms. And if you don't have the new version of Forms, yours probably looks a little like this. And there's that purple band that seems to uh, uh, elude most people that says, try the new Google Forms. If you click on that, you'll see the new Google Forms looks a little bit more like that. Uh, if that freaks you out and you panic and you want to go back, there's a little running man. You can run back to the safety of the old Google Forms. Just keep in mind, at some point, Google is going to kick you out of the nest and say, uh-uh you are going to go full-fledged into the new version of Google Forms. I expect that rollout will be fairly soon because the, new feature, the features from the old version of Forms are now part of the new version of Forms. Uh, and uh, so eventually, uh, so probably within the next little while, 
uh, they'll force you into the new version of Google Forms without giving you the option to go back. Uh, when the new version of Google Forms came out, there were features such as add-ons and data validation that were not live. Uh, those are live now and we're gonna be covering some of that. Most of today's session is going to cover where the bells and whistles of Google, the new version of Google Forms are. So, and then some hidden features or features that pr probably not a lot of people are aware of if you're not a power user of Google Forms, maybe you haven't dug in as deep. Uh, so we're gonna show you where some of those pieces are, get familiar because they have moved things around and kind of hidden them, uh, and we're gonna go through that. And then we'll talk about some ways to use them, forms for administrators, forms for K3, uh, and a variety of ways to use them creatively. We'll try to cover all that in about an hour. All right, so a couple different ways to get to Google Forms. One is from your Google Drive, and if you click New, hover over More, and select Google Forms, you can start creating a Google Form there. So start straight from Google Drive. They have added a new way to get to Google Forms, and that's go to forms.google.com, and you'll notice it looks like this. So it just, just like they have docs.google.com where you can see just your docs or sheets, they now have one where you can see just your forms. Also brand new and kind of exciting is templates. There are Google Forms templates and there are even more Google Forms templates such as exit tickets, assessments, worksheets. I shudder when I say that word, but they do have it there. Course evals, t-shirt sign up, party invites, RSVPs. Uh, customer feedback, so they have a, a variety of templates for Google Forms that are already built in, and you would get there if you go to forms.google.com and you click on more, you can see all of the forms that they have, uh, uh, the templates, at least the ones that they have so far. So a couple of the new features of Google Forms is one is on the editing page when you're creating a Google Form, it's kind of divided up into two sections. The initial section is where it says questions. This is the editing view of Google Forms where you can add in new questions, where you can edit the questions, uh, change them up, move them around, add in different features. But right next to where it says questions, you'll see responses. Uh, responses, and that there'll be a number that will show you how many responses you have to the form. And it shows it initially in summary. Again, keep in mind, if you have a multiple choice type of question, such as this scale question, uh, or some of the other questions we have here, so this is what a scale question looks like. That's the data visualization for that, this scale question right here. Uh, this is a straight multiple choice question here, and you'll see it creates a pie graph for you. You can also see individual results. So this is the summary results from everybody's results. But I can look at individual results, so just as someone that filled out the form, I can see all the points where they filled out, uh, where they chose number seven here, they chose whatever this answer is here, I can't read at that angle, uh, looks like it says Panthers. And then I can move from answer to answer, so I can see that I have 10 different replies to this form, so I can see them one at a time. That's also a new feature that rolled out even after this version of forms came out. So again, you can see this summary, or individual one at a time. And then of course you can drop it into the spreadsheet. So on the responses page, you see that nice little green spreadsheet icon. If you click on that, it gives you the opportunity to create a new spreadsheet and all your data from your form goes into that spreadsheet. I mentioned that this uh, new version of spreadsheets allows for data visualizations that are automatically created. Down in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a little Explore button there. If you click on that, so you'll notice it gives you an even different type of data visualization than what the form does. So it puts those there for you. One of the really cool things about this is I can highlight some of the rows. When I highlight some of those rows, uh, it gives me, the, it changes these uh, graphs to f reflect just the rows that I've highlighted. Or if I highlight a particular column, these graphs will reflect just the data that's in that column. So that's kind of a new and cool feature there. All right, when you create a question, in fact, the very first question you create here is a multiple choice question. In fact, every time you create a new question, it's always gonna be multiple choice, so you have to manually change it. 
This is the new uh, section here where you add in questions in different sections and what have you. It sits over here in this little sidebar uh, next to the question you're currently editing. And the little plus means you can add a question. The TT says add title and description. If you're familiar with the older versions of forms, they used to be called sections, but that gives you a text box that you can add in a title to break up the uh, questions that you have in there, and it gives you a paragraph box that if you wanted to copy and paste some text in there uh, for students to reply to, you can break up your questions uh, with, a, with a title and description. Or maybe it's just a title and description for a group of questions you have. You put that in, put your questions, put the next title and description, you can put that in as well. You can use it in a variety of ways, but just keep in mind that that used to be called section. You can add in images. When you add in images into Google Forms, it just puts it in one at a time uh, in vertical alignment. So if you have multiple images that you want side by side to ask questions about, say maybe this right here, that you wanna ask questions about three different books or three different movies or three different objects, uh, you can't line them up side by side right there within Forms. However, there's a workaround for that, Google Drawing. This is, what I did is I went into Google Drawing, I took these three pictures, I lined them up side by side, and I clicked File, Download as an image file. So it created, took these three separate images and created them as a single image. I could then put it in my form and ask questions about that image. So just keep that in mind as a workaround for your, when you're inserting images. You can also add in YouTube videos and you can add in sections. So what used to be called sections is now title and description. What used to be called page breaks is now called sections. And so you'll see that you have a section up here. This is section one. There's a break here where it talks about the navigation. And then here is section two. So the idea is this, is, this would be like section one, that would be section two. So it's breaking it up into different sections. Up at the top corner, in the top right corner are some, navigate, are some tools that you can go to that will help you edit the form. Uh, the first one I wanna talk about is the one that looks like a paint palette, and that's exactly what it is. It's the color palette and banners. Uh, you don't have the same controls you, that you did have of being able to change the fonts uh, and the font sizes in the, in, within the form itself. However, you can change the color. The default is this purple. Uh, if you click on it, it does give you the option to change different colors, and in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that you can add in images. If you click on that image icon, it pulls this up and it has a variety of, of banners that you can choose from, as well as you can upload your own photos. Those of you who, who have used Google Classroom will recognize these banners, and it kind of lends credence to the theory that some of my friends have bandied about that the new version of Google Forms is the love child of Google Classroom and the old version of Forms. They, they kind of look alike, and I, I don't know if they re, 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 revamped this to make them work better together or just to make it uh, look like a consistent, uh, give it a consistent look. Uh, we may, it, maybe there's a hint there that there may be a tighter integration between Google Forms and Classroom. That'd be kind of nice. Um, but there, you can change out the banners as well as change out the colors. The little eyeball next to the paint palette is the preview. When you hover over it, that used to be called live view. Um, so if you want to see the live view of it and have a link to send out to uh, someone else or post on a website or paste into an email, uh, you click on that eyeball and copy that link there. Next to that is the settings gear. In the settings gear is where they hid the, uh, the section about who can respond. One of the important things to remember if you are in a Google Apps for Education domain, when you create a form, by default, only people within your domain can access that form. So if you are wanting to do a parent survey or survey the general public or people that are not in your domain, you have to manually change that and that's there under that settings gear and you have to click on there where it says uh, only people within your domain uh, can access it and change that to anyone. However, if you leave this so that only people within your domain can access it, 
so maybe you only want your students or your staff to be able to access your form, you can select the box here that says automatically collect their username. So that's a feature that you can do and it'll create a column in the spreadsheet where it creates their, uh, collects their username. So if you're using something like Fluberu that grades the form automatically, um, that it will, uh, it will uh, give you an email address to send them back their grades or to send their grades to Google Drive. You can also restrict it so that there's only one response per form. Uh, that does require a login. It does not require a domain login. It could be just any Google account login, um, so, but it does restrict that there. Uh, it doesn't collect the information. This is the one that collects the information. It will only collect the information if it's from a Google Apps domain. But this one right here, they, while they have to log in with a Google account, it does not, uh, it, it does not collect that information. So it's still private information. Uh, to the person that's filling out the form. You don't get that information, but it does prevent them from filling out the form more than once with that Google account. If you were me, you could fill it out probably close to two dozen times because I have about two dozen different Google accounts. Don't judge, okay? There's a reason for it, mostly because I do way too much Google stuff, but that's another story. You have the option here to shuffle the question order. So your form, it will shuffle the or question order. A pro tip for that is you want to put in a page break. So if you're asking things like period, first name, last name, you're gonna wanna put in a section break after that. Because if you're asking for period, first name, last name, and you don't put in a section break, question three could be last name, question 17 could be period, and question 20 could be first name because it shuffles them up all throughout the, however, if you put in period, first name, last name and put in a section break, it keeps those three questions together. So the shuffle is a little more, uh, at least they're, they may be shuffled in a, kind of an odd order, but at least they're close enough together that it doesn't totally freak people out that they're all over the place. And even though it shuffles the question order, I get this question a lot, even though it shuffles the question order, the answers always go into the same place in the spreadsheet. It goes into the right, correct place. The three little dots are more, and there under more you can make a copy of the form. So if you have a form that you use uh, and you need to make copies of it, you, basically you have a template of a form, uh, you can create that template and then just make a copy of it and make those minor adjustments and use that uh, there. You can add collaborators to your form. So just like any Google Doc or most of your Google tools where you can have multiple people editing the same, uh, set, same Google item, you can have multiple people editing the same Google form. And one of my favorite features is add-ons. This is where you get add-ons. You'll notice I didn't talk about this little puzzle piece up here because until you add add-ons, you don't see that puzzle piece. So you may or may not see that until you go here to the, the more and then select add-ons and you can add on features to the forms and once you do that, they'll be there under that puzzle piece. I'm only gonna talk about a few of them and some of my favorites. Uh, one of them, so one of the things you wanna do with Google Forms is you wanna make all questions required. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but you filled out something online, you hit the button, and the little message came up and said you forgot to fill out that part of the question. Okay, don't need to raise your hand. We know we're all guilty of it, okay? So when you fill out, when you create a form, you wanna have that same feature to stop people, keep people from submitting the form incompletely. And so you can manually go through all your questions and click required because there's nothing within the form itself that says to turn that on as default. However, one of the new add-ons is all questions required. So you go in, you create your form. When you're done with your form, you go to your add-ons, click all questions required, click, turn that on, and all your questions in your form will be required. So it's one of my favorite new features because I have really wanted that ability to be able to turn on all questions required as a default from day one because I taught middle and elementary school and trying to get them to answer everything and pay attention to answer every single question, well, you, you know how that can work out. 
Choice Eliminator is another one. I have heard that there was some issues. I think it was with Choice Eliminator 1. You'll notice this as Choice Eliminator 2. Hopefully that solves some of those. But the idea behind that is say you have a parent-teacher conference or you're setting up comp, uh, em employee review conferences uh, uh, with your staff and you set up a certain number of time slots and as soon as somebody chooses that time slot, it disappears, okay? Or think of potlucks. How many have been to a potluck where you got 30 bags of chips and two, two two liter bottles of soda, right? So you set up your Google form, you decide how many of each you want, when the, that number is selected, it disappears out of the form. So that's choice eliminator. Form notifications. When the form is filled out, now they're in spreadsheets, there's already built in that whoever owns the spreadsheet can get a notification. But what if I want somebody else to get a notification? Think of an anti-bullying report form or a classroom referral form, or an office supply form. With form notifications, somebody fills out that form, and, and it, maybe it's a bullying report. You got a QR code and a short URL up on posters around the campus, a student witnesses something, they fill out the form on their phone, and bingo, an administrator gets an email saying this incident occurred. Or you're in the classroom, and you have a, a classroom incident, you have to go to the phone, you have to call the office, wait for them to answer, they have to track down an administrator, and in the meanwhile, your class is going a little crazy, right? Well, if you fill out the form really quickly, an administrator gets an email, and then they're showing up at your door to help out with a classroom incident. Or fill out the classroom referral, or the classroom uh, supply order form, the secretary gets an email, orders it, next thing you know, you got whiteboard markers in your mailbox. So that's form notifications. Uh, form publisher, if you remember Autocrat, which takes the information from a form and it drops it into a document, form uh, publisher will do that uh, for you as well. There's a couple of them that will do it. Form limiter, it limits the amount of time or the number of responses that the form is available. So maybe you only wanted the form available for seven days or you only want the first hundred respondents, you can turn that on with form limiter. And then if you're a math teacher, you want to use GMath for forms because writing up some of the equations and using some of the math symbols, GMath allows you to use the latex math scripting uh, language to be able to create uh, math formulas for your forms. And a new one that Eddie Campos, uh, sitting back there, yeah, showed me, told me about today is called Roll Call. So think of this. You're, uh, you give people an option to select a certain number of different, from a certain number of different workshops, and they sign up for them. Well, Roll Call, what it does is if maybe, say, they signed up for a Google Forms class, it takes all the people signed up for that and drops them into one tab in the spreadsheet. If they signed up for a Google Maps class, such as the class I'm teaching this afternoon, it takes all the people that signed up for that and drops them into a separate tab in the spreadsheet. So each one that they choose it drops them into a separate tab so you have a roll sheet for each uh, workshop that they signed up for. So that's kind of a new one. Thanks, Eddie, appreciate that, because I'm gonna be using that. One of the features that's been around for a while is branch logic, and with multiple choice questions, you can direct questions to go to a page based on an answer. And so again, it's in multiple choice. You got these three little dots over here. If, when you click on that, it says go to section based on answer. And if you select that, next to each of your multiple choice answer items, it gives you the option of where to send that to. You have to have those section breaks, so it'll send it to a different section. So for instance, you have a, set, you have a survey, and you're surveying a variety of different people. Maybe your, it's your LCAP survey. Remember, you're supposed to survey uh, a variety of people for your LCAP. And so maybe you have some administrators, teachers, students, uh, parents, and so in, you have some custom questions for each of those groups. Administrators are gonna answer a certain group of questions. Uh, teachers and parents will ask different sets of questions. So depending on what they answer, you can tell it go to that section uh, if you click on those three dots and choose go to section based on answer. There's also data validation. Do you know you can set a password on a form? So if you have a website or you've posted that Google form somewhere and you don't want them filling it out uh, until you're ready, because form, uh, form limiters 
turns the form off, but there's nothing to turn a form on, okay? So maybe you post that on cl in Classroom or on Edmodo, but you don't want them filling that out until you're ready in class that day. So what you do, the way to set a password, it's a workaround, it's not really setting a password, but it is kind of. You put in a text question, you ask, what is the password? You click on the three little dots here, and you go to data validation. Once you hit data validation, over here, you'll change this from number to text, and say contains, and then you put the password. So the password is today is open sesame. And so you type in whatever your password is there, and then you can put in some custom text, like I said, please enter the password there. And if they don't enter in the password, uh, when, they, when you ask this question, it's gonna say, please enter the password. So a short answer question, data validation, allows you to set up as a password uh, there that they can't enter that in. They can't go past it until they enter it. And again, that requires the question to be required too though. You can also force your, a short answer question to be in the form of an email or a short answer um, under text. You can force it to be an email address or a valid URL. So you can force that there. On short answer, you have number validation and you can force it to be greater than, equal to, you can force it to be a whole number or just to be a number. So that's under the short, on a short answer question, the data validation for number. On a paragraph question, that's another one of the question types, you can force a minimum or maximum character count. On check boxes, you can choose to, that they have to select at least or at most or select exactly. Because on a check boxes question, they can choose more than one uh, of the multiple choice answers. So you can, with data validation, you can force how many of them that they have to answer. This is what a grid question looks like. Notice you have columns and you have rows, okay? So when you're editing, you have your rows and columns and on your data validation, you can require one response per row. You can also limit to one response per column on the grid questions. So that's pretty much where all the bells and whistles are with Google Forms uh, as far as where they move some of the stuff around and some of the features there. So I wanna talk now a little bit about some of the ways you can use Google Forms. Um, those of you who are not using Google Classroom, you've probably run into this issue where students share their work with you. And next thing you know, you got your inbox full with, of emails because it automatically sends an email notification every time a student shares their work with you. Now if you're using Google Classroom, you won't need this tip here. Uh, in fact, I would recommend if you're not using Google Classroom and you're using Google Drive, jump on it, get with it, because it's really a great way of collecting assignments. Um, but what I did before uh, Google Classroom came along is I just had a simple four question form. I asked them what period they're in, their first name and last name, and a link to their assignment. And then they, all they had to do is on their, their Google Doc was change it to so that anyone with the link can comment. And then I had a spreadsheet that took the information from the form dropped into a spreadsheet, I could then sort that and then click on their assignment. And it works for any web-based assignment, not just for a Google Form. It could be for a uh, Powtoon or a Prezi or a video or, or anything. You know, maybe they create a video and upload it to YouTube. They could drop in a link to that YouTube video there. Um, and then you have it in the spreadsheet. And you have a one, one spreadsheet for each assignment. So that was a nice simple way of collecting stuff maybe lesson plans if you're collecting lesson plans from your staff. Although again, keep in mind, if you have Google Classroom, you can, why not create a Google Classroom for your staff? And if you like collecting lesson plans, have them turn those in in Google Classroom. It gives you access to that. So if, you're, if, you're, if you have access to Google Classroom, I strongly suggest you use that. If you don't, uh, or you don't wanna make that jump, uh, this is a nice quick way of getting away from that email overload uh, for, from oversharing of Google Forms. One of my favorite tools was invented by one of my students, and it's called an instant feedback quiz. And this here was created by a seventh grade student, her name was Martha, 
And this is actually a screenshot of her original quiz. And what she did is she created a question and when you answered the question and you click continue, you found out right away what the answer was. Now keep in mind that within Google Forms there is nothing built into Google Forms that does grading. Okay, it doesn't grade within Google Forms. It only, the, the only way to grade it is in the spreadsheet if you have the Flubaru script. That will do the grading for you. Okay, but within Google Forms there's nothing that will grade, but she found, figured out a way to be able to give instant feedback so the student could find out right away if they were right or wrong when they answered a question. So for instance, this is one I set up here. You ask a question and then they have to click next. It used to be continue, now it's next. Click next and they find out right away what the correct answer was. They click next, they get the next question, they answer the question, and you'll notice it's a required question, so they can't jump ahead and see that. They actually have to commit to an answer. So think of how flashcards are typically used. Student looks at the flashcard, they kind of they kind of read the question, and then they flip it over and they look at the answer on the other side. And they kind of flip back and forth. Well, no brain cells were disturbed during that process, okay? <laughs> Because for this to work, a student has to read the question and formulate and commit to an answer. It's that act of formulating and committing to the answer and then the feedback that they get immediately to confirm or disconfirm what the answer is that enables the, the learning process to take place. So by them having to fill out this form and commit to an answer on the form and then find out right away what the correct answer is, that's the power of that, okay? So they have to commit to an answer. So think of this like flashcards or a study aid. And I didn't create these for my students. I had my students create these. And then they turned them in into one of those Google Forms. And then I shared the spreadsheet with links to all of the, the instant feedback quizzes to the students. And then they could study each other's quizzes. So it was a nice, quick way of using both of those tools to be able to help my students study and create their own study. And just the very act of them creating their own questions, we know how powerful of an effect that has. When students formulate their own questions, it means that they have examined the material on a deeper level uh, than just merely answering the questions themselves because they have to think about it and formulate the question. You know, what would my teacher ask about this? How can, what, what question would determine that I really know this answer? So here's the process for that. You create a question, and then remember that section break that used to be called page break? You put in a section, and you put the answer in the section, okay? Then you put in a second section, and you wanna leave that blank. And so basically you have to erase, because it says section title, so I just hit the space bar, and that makes it erase, erases it. And then you repeat that process. So it's question, section, section, question, section, section, question, section, section. Your first section has the answer. The second section is blank. Does that make sense? Stunned silence. I love it. All right. So keep that in mind. And, and if you get stuck on it, get, tweet at me. Shoot me an email. I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, Another feature that I really like with Google Forms is you can create choose your own adventure stories. Even better, students can create their own choose your own adventure stories. So you have a piece of a story, and then you have to have a multiple choice question for that. So if they answer here, do they, uh, they basically the story line here is they're in the house, they find a carp piece of carpet, and underneath the carpet in the closet, there's a trap door. Do they go through the, uh, open the door and go through, or do they keep the door closed? Well, the store would be kind of boring if they kept the door closed, right? Um, so they go into the dark chamber under the house. And the cool thing about Google Forms is you can kick it up a notch and add in pictures and videos. In fact, if you go to my website, there's one that I have. Uh, it's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you remember the scene 
where Arthur and his uh, men are about to cross the bridge, and they come to the, the bridge keeper, and he asks them questions, and if they answer the question wrong, they go flying over, flying over into the air. If they answer it correctly, they get to cross the bridge. And so I chopped that up with the video pieces for each section of, of, of the event, and then added in some questions, the same question the bridge keeper asked them, and the answers were the answers that the knights would give, and they choose that answer, and if they choose the wrong answer, they go flying off in the bridge, you know, the next video shows them flying over into the bridge. So there's a lot of creative ways to create the stories beyond just text. Think of adding in pictures and videos to kind of spice them up. So the, is dark underneath the house? Do they get a flashlight or go under the house? And so based on what they choose. So again, that go to page based on answer, this is the older screenshot from the older version, but you've already seen where the go to page based on answer is uh, with multiple choice. And so depending on what, depending on what they choose, it takes them to the page where that's at. One of the things I would recommend strongly if you or your students are going to do this is you're gonna to need to write out a road map to guide with, especially the more complicated they get. Uh, you're you're gonna to wanna to have that written out so that you know that where everything is going and even maybe even draw it out as a chart. Um, otherwise, it can get very complicated very fast, especially the more complicated they are. On my website, I have several examples of choose your own adventure stories. Uh, as well as some from some other teachers uh, that have shared those, uh, and so that you could take a look at some ideas and examples. One of, the, one of the Common Core ELA standards, the anchor standards, is that students are supposed to use digital tools to produce writing. This is a form of writing where they have to think about it. In fact, they have to do some critical thinking skills and some problem solving skills. So it's beyond just writing a story, they have to actually think about it, formulate it, plan it, do some critical thinking, so it takes it up to that next level. And that's where we want to get students going and doing, is beyond just the basics. You know, they could, fill, they could write a story. Students are pretty good at writing narrative stories uh, because they've been doing it, you know. We, we kind of drive that into, in fact, is some of the other writing skills that we haven't had them do. So this, let's take it up a notch and have them do some critical thinking skills. And if you think that K3 students can't do it, um, just keep in mind that they can. Uh, I have some resources at, uh, well, I don't have some resources. Susan Stewart has some resources at primarilygoogle.com. So if you go to primarilygoogle.com, you'll see some K3 resources for Google Forms. So this is an example of a Google Form for kindergarten. And remember that I talked about having images side by side, so they choose the image and then uh, use that, uh, they create the uh, graph uh, based on who voted for what. So there's a question of the day for the kindergartners. So kindergartners can do this. This is student created. Uh, I believe this is second grade. Uh, he created the survey and then went in and created the, uh, created the graph. Things like character analysis where you put in a video and then you ask some questions about analyzing the characters of the people that are in the video. Or uh, going into uh, ReadWorks or Newzella or any other place where you have informational text uh, because students need to get in that habit of reading informational text. Um, copying and pasting that into either a title uh, and description area or into a section break. Uh, you can copy and paste that text into there and then ask questions about that text. So this is, again, uh, a piece of text from ReadWorks, uh, and then there's a series of questions. I only copied the, uh, uh, screenshotted the first part of it. There's a series of questions about that article there. Or students introducing themselves on the first day. You know, the first day of class, how many students are actually gonna get up and, and speak up and introduce themselves out loud to the class? Well, this might be a way to scaffold that where they fill this out, and then they can get up and introduce themselves, and you also have a permanent record of it, not just uh, them talking and then you forgetting what, who said what. Crowdsourcing. One of the great things about a Google Form is the ability to collect a variety of data. So think of a math class or a science class 
where students are measuring their, uh, whether they're checking temperature or they're measuring degrees or measuring perimeter and area. And they can fill out a form on, any, uh, on pretty much any device. So Android or Apple phones or tablets or computers. And you don't even have to log in to fill out a Google form. So if you want to crowdsource the information, we've had, I've taken students out and had them walk around and measure a variety of objects. And then we have a database of all of that information. So for instance, pi. On pi day, we go out and measure circles, measure the circumference, and measure the diameter, measure the radius. And then we have this whole database that we can go through and examine and say, OK, how, do we, how accurate are our measurements? How close do we approach uh, pi? Because we know this is what pi should be. Um, or if you're collecting data, you, uh, you have a variety of different science experiments that are going, going on. Um, and you can have the students input their information into that, into the form, and then in the spreadsheet they can collect that. But think of this at, the, at, at pretty much any grade level, where uh, it says type your first name three times, use the space bar, and then enter 10 words that help you think about the season of winter. Then you copy and paste that information from the spreadsheet into a word cloud tool such as Wordle or Tagzito, and you've crowdsourced the information because one of the things about a word cloud is you gotta come up with the text for that. Well, if you're t talking about, you know, you want everybody to contribute 10 words about winter, you don't wanna be the one typing that in. So with a Google form, you have them fill it out, they type in those 10 words, you copy and paste it from the spreadsheet into that, you've now crowdsourced your information. So keep in, keep that, keep in mind that about uh, Google Forms, that they're a great way to collaborate. Don't forget you can add in uh, images and videos. And by the way, some of these forms I have examples of, or Susan has examples of uh, here, that uh, you can go to and take a look at. Uh, this is a fact or opinion question, adding in some, uh, some uh, videos here. You can add in uh, questions about that and to, to test students' knowledge and then collect that information into a form to take a look and see how well uh, they've approached that information. I mentioned I'm also uh, part of TCAL, so we were talking about K3 resources. Uh, TCAL is a resource center for administrators, uh, and beyond just what we have with Google Forms, there's a variety of in, uh, information there uh, around technology for administrators, such as uh, we have a blog on administrative issues, we have uh, interviews, uh, a ton of resources, and we work together three or four times a year to, to add to that. Um, if you go to tcal.portacal.org and you look under tools um, and you look for forms, you'll see things like a teacher self-assessment of the ISTE net standards, there's classroom walkthroughs and observations. I mentioned a bullying report form. TCAL already has created a bullying report form for you to go to, for you to use it that office supply form and a variety of different forms that administrators would use. Uh, so go to portacal.org or send your administrator there. There's a ton of resources there, especially around Google Forms. Also, uh, there is, uh, the links in, are in the, in the presentation for a Google Forms spreadsheet and forms training and help, uh, as well as an article uh, that I posted here uh, from someone that wrote an article about 80 plus different forms for the classroom. So there's a variety of ways to do that. Uh, for sake of time, we won't have time to get into what Fluberu looks like, but if you go to fluberu.com, that's F-L-U-B-A-R-O-O.com, fluberu.com, uh, Dave has a bunch of resources there that will guide you through how to use his script to grade Google Forms. It doesn't grade all types of questions, but it does grade certain types of questions. So just keep that in mind uh, at fluberu.com. And my, again, my resources are on the forms page at teachinteractive.org. All righty, thank you for coming. Uh, keep in mind, resources are at teachinteractive.org. Hope to hear from you. Be glad to help out however I can.